And Maddie, Steve, or Jim, can you please confirm that you see my presentation uh, and it should be in full screen view? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. Looks good. Thank you. Yes, I can actually read it, so that's good. Isn't that nice? All right, and it looks like Johnny was able to join. Johnny, I saw you maybe were having some audio issues. Um, it looks like everything is good now. Yeah, I'm good. Good. So those of you who have just uh, jumped on the call, we will probably get started just a minute or two after one o'clock and let a few more people join. Justin Pearson, just in, if anyone's interested, just got reinstated. That makes two. It has just been a heavy news week. I think we probably can say that for the last couple of years. So seeing quite a few people I was expecting to see. Um, I, I think, Steve, we can probably expect a couple more TMAs to join as well. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll just we'll kick it off here maybe in, in, in another minute. We'll give it one more minute because it's, it's 1259 now. So that sounds good. Um, and just a reminder for everybody, this meeting is being recorded. After this call, we'll go ahead and post this to the drcog.org website. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour, so I say we go ahead and get started. Um, I will ask all of you, if you're not speaking, to please mute yourselves. I do have the ability to mute people, but I don't want to exercise that uh, responsibility, especially if we if we uh, go to Q&A and, and need you to speak up. Um, so with that housekeeping right. note, I so I all right, I will just go ahead and mute people um, that was that's timely it is oh i i muted steve so that's an ability i have all right so um, I think everybody who is not speaking is muted. We can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just gonna turn things over to Steve Erickson quickly to do um, some brief introductions and then we will get started on this presentation. Thank you, Nisha. And good afternoon, everyone on this beautiful Colorado day. Uh, this is why we live here, right? As Nisha said, we, we did the kickoff for Viva Streets uh, here a few hours ago, and it really was quite warm in the sun. But boy, it just uh, it's just gorgeous out there. So try to find some time and and get out there and enjoy it today. So um, want to welcome everybody uh, to our transportation demand management services set aside workshop. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of information today. I want to assure you, uh, you know, not 
that we're not going to cover every slide in a lot of detail. For some of you, this is probably new information. For many of you, this is uh, something, if you've been through the process before, uh, a lot of this will uh, seem very familiar to you. There are not a lot of changes in terms of process, particularly, or even criteria from uh, the call two years ago. So again, hopefully some, uh, some of this information will will be review and, and kind of reminder. Um, we are just as, as most of you know, uh, here at Dr. Cog, we have a transportation improvement funds, federal funds that are available to us. And in addition to funding uh, the Way to Go Partnership, which Nisha manages, uh, working with our eight transportation management association partners in the region, we also have funding available for these TDM set aside projects. And so one of the important things to take away from this is that the, the projects uh, that we will end up funding typically really work in concert with, with Way to Go. And Nisha will get into obviously the goals of the program. But um, you know, bottom line, it's really about reducing traffic congestion to improve our air quality. Um, so with that, let's just um, do some quick introductions and then I'm going to hand it back to, to Nisha. Uh, so again, I'm Steve, uh, Communications and Marketing Director, and oversee uh, the Way to Go program in my division. We're joined by Aaron Busto, a statewide and metropolitan transportation planner with the Colorado Division of the Federal Highway Administration. Also joined by John Mark Antonio, a project manager of mobility services with Colorado Department of Transportation. Nisha is our Way to Go program manager, and the other presenter today will be Jim Eshelman, who is our market research program manager, but also does a lot of um, uh, administrative work on both our grants here at Dr. Cog and some of the partnership and, and um, uh, TIP funded uh, grants here as well. So each will have sort of a, a role in this and we'll work through it and happy to answer questions. The other main takeaway I want uh, everyone to, to hear loud and clear is we are here to help. We're looking to uh, find really good projects that make a difference in the region. We want to be a resource to help you as, as you uh, are preparing to submit an application. So with that, Nisha, I think I'll hand it, uh, hand it back to you. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Steve. Um, I am just going to talk a little bit about process for today's call um, before we sort of talk about agenda items and what topics we're going to cover. So just wanted to uh, let everybody know, as I mentioned a couple times, this meeting is going to be recorded. Um, we will be posting the recording of this meeting as well as the deck that I'm going to present from today to uh, the drcog.org website. Um, and Maddie will actually, uh, Madeline Bjorn Holt, who you've received some communications from, she is actually on the line today. She'll be monitoring chat um, and she will be uploading all of those materials and then uh, we'll be sharing quite a few links with you during this, during this presentation. Um, I would like to ask everybody who's on this call today to please leave a little bit of information about yourselves in the chat. We would love to know your name. We'd like to know what organization you're part of. Um, please tell us if you've applied for uh, set aside funding in the past. And then finally, just let us know a little bit about what your intention is for the project. We will be also downloading the transcript and saving this for our records. Excellent. So I did just want to talk quickly about the purpose of this call. Uh, we really are here, as Steve mentioned, to empower all of you project sponsors to craft a strong letter of intent and uh, actually submit a really great application um, with help from Dr. Cog and some of our stakeholders. So um, with that, let's kind of go ahead and talk about the agenda. Um, you can see all of the agenda items we're covering. I'm going to go into detail around eligibility, funding amounts, um, and uh, we'll we'll sort of turn over some of the the other topics to our to our other subject matter experts. Um, but I do just want to say another kind of quick housekeeping note. I know many of you may have questions throughout this presentation. I'm going to ask you to do one of two things if you have a question. The first one is to feel free to drop your question into chat. As I mentioned, Maddie is going to be monitoring chat. Um, and I have 
in two places within the middle of this presentation. I have two slides that say questions. We'll be breaking for questions periodically. And of course, we will answer any questions you have at the end of this call. If you can hold your questions that you don't put into chat until we have this uh, question slide in front of you, just raise your hand. Maddie will call on you. You can unmute yourself and speak. So that is kind of how we'll be uh, handling this. This is quite a long presentation. As Steve mentioned, um, you know, we won't go super into detail with all of the, you know, requirements for the project, the application, um, et cetera. But we will provide you with enough information that hopefully you feel empowered to um, get started on that letter of intent. So wanted to talk a little bit about the Transportation Improvement Program and how Dr. Cog manages um, manages uh, these, these set-asides. And give me one second, I am just gonna go on, yeah. do not disturb. Um, perfect. So the Transportation Improvement Program for fiscal years 2024 mm -hmm. through 2027 will identify basically state and federal funded transportation projects to be implemented in the Denver region. So that's um, sort of what we're talking about today. We're talking about one of those set-asides. Um, and Dr. Cog's Transportation Improvement Program is what funds these set-asides. Um, and actually in March 2023, Dr. Cog's board voted for all of the transportation improvement program set asides to be governed under a common policies um, for the next upcoming 2024-27 fiscal year cycle. Um, and this document is going to provide applicants with a guide for applying under any program. So it's a really great document. Um, I can actually drop this um, drop this into chat for you later, um, or maybe Maddie can drop that into chat, but basically it's a PDF document with a lot of information around all of the TIP funding that Dr. Cog offers. So in the next few slides, I'm going to look at all of Dr. Cog's TIP set-aside programs, um, and we're going to just talk at a very high level about all of these. So the first one is the Corridor Community Livability and Innovation Planning Grant. Um, this is actually a new set-aside for the fiscal years 2024 through 2027, and this $12 million set-aside is really intended to support the Regional Transportation Plan, identify and assess the needs of marginalized communities in the region, and it also seeks to develop innovative solutions for a variety of regional mobility challenges. So um, that is that is kind of the, the first um, grant we'll talk about or just review very quickly. And then the TDM services um, grant, this funds basically three categories, including TDM non-infrastructure projects set aside. Um, and that's what's highlighted in orange. That is actually the funding that we'll be talking about today. And the TDM services set aside also funds Dr. Cog's Way to Go program, which is my program. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Way to Go as well as the partnership um, later on in this slide. And it also funds the eight TMAs in the partnership as well. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. So we just have these different buckets of funding. There are too many to fit on one slide. So this is sort of a continuation of that table. As I mentioned, I will talk about all of these different um, funding opportunities, but the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, um, which actually will be having its mandatory application workshop a couple weeks from now, um, this funding uh, cycle or, or type actually seeks to improve safety, efficiency, dependability, and affordability of our regional transportation systems. Um, and this includes agencies like Dr. Cog, CDOT, and, and RTD uh, working together on RTOT programs to implement systems and technologies. We also, um, we also administer air quality improvement funds, and these are dedicated exclusively for the Regional Air Quality Council, or RAC, who we, we work very closely with. And uh, this funding is used for ozone outreach, education, marketing, and the state implementation plan modeling. Um, finally, talk a little bit about the Human Service Transportation Funds, um, and these funds, uh, they go toward transit capital, operating, and mobility management, um, and really these projects to improve service and mobility options for vulnerable people. 
So as I mentioned, though, we are here today to talk about the TDM services set aside. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what TDM means. Uh, TDM stands for Transportation Demand Management. And uh, TDM really refers to strategies that help people use our transportation system more effectively. Um, TDM strategies typically result in reduced traffic congestion, reduced vehicle emissions, and reduced fuel consumption. So not only do they have these big environmental impacts, but they can also um, you know, help individuals save money. Um, so really feel like this can bring some equity to the region. And finally, uh, TDM improves air quality. And that's really um, one of our big concerns as the way to go, as way to go program. Mm -hmm. So this particular TDM set aside supports TDM strategies and proposals. Um, now we are looking at projects that um, focus on outreach, education, marketing, and research. And we'll talk a little bit more about that eligibility later. Um, but essentially these set aside funds should go toward projects that reduce the number of miles people travel in single occupant vehicles, um, and basically project applicants are going to be asked to show how their program will improve air quality while reducing traffic congestion. All right, so in the next couple slides, I'm gonna talk more broadly about eligibility, what are the different funding levels and what does this process look like for applicants? So we saw in that table, the total set aside funding over fiscal years 2024 through 27 is $2 million. Um, for this upcoming funding period, oh, sorry, I just advanced the slide on accident. Um, for this upcoming funding period, we have a million dollars um, to, to give. So I wanted to just, um, just ask everybody before they go down the road of, you know, submitting a letter of intent for this project, just be aware that you are one of the agencies who is eligible for funding. So you must be able to be a recipient of transportation funds, federal transportation funds. Um, and then you also must be in good standing with the state of Colorado. Um, there is just a lot of uh, information on this slide that I will ask you to read and determine your eligibility for before you go down the path of, of applying for a grant. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the match requirement further on. This is sort of just a, a slide where we talk about math. Um, so we'll, we'll table that for now and kind of leave that as a high level topic. So I did just want to talk through what this funding process looks like, or rather the application process. So we ha have basically this nine step roadmap outlined right here. Um, and once you've attended this workshop that you're you're at right now um, and established that you're eligible for TDM set aside funds, you can then begin planning in collaboration with Dr. Cog. So your first step is going to be to draft a letter of intent. Now you can reach out to my team. Um, you can reach out to me or Maddie before you draft the letter of intent, or you can draft the letter of intent. Um, and then what we will do is our panel will actually review all of those letters. Um, we will then invite certain applicants to apply based on the strength of their letter of intent. We will, however, get in touch with everybody who submits a letter of intent, and we will work with you to make sure that you're able to craft your application in such a way that it meets the criteria for this funding. So I did just want to reassure everybody that Dr. Cog and the way to go team are here to help you craft that strong application, starting with the letter of intent. Um, let's see, um, I'll talk a little bit in the next slide about scoring criteria. But essentially, once all of those applications get scored by the panel, we will then reach out to project applicants and notify them of next steps. So we are going to have an, a panel um, of, of basically subject matter experts to assess all of the applications, um, and that panel will most likely include my team, the Way to Go team, and stakeholders from Dr. Cog divisions, including the Area Agency on Aging, the Transportation Planning and Operations team, as well as Regional Planning and Development. Um, but we're also going to have some external stakeholders be a part of this process, and these could include um, stakeholders from Federal Highway Administration, CDOT, CDPHE, RAC, RTD, and other TDM professionals. 
we'll uh, score the applications based on the strength of each criteria. How does it align to each criteria? Again, we'll uh, go over that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, and then based on the merits of each project proposal, we will decide which of the projects gets funded. And um, there is, again, I think a lot of great information in that PDF document that I referenced just around eligibility um, and, and project criteria. After we have selected, and we, I mean the panel has selected which projects we would like to recommend for funding, we will then take those projects to two of our transportation committees, and then we'll take it over to the board of directors for final approval. So here is just a snapshot of what the scoring criteria looks like. You can see um, VMT or the, the reduction in the number of vehicle miles traveled is going to be one of the strongest criteria here. Um, we're also going to be doing some data driven scoring as well, looking at um, basically, you know, all of these other criteria. So um, I think this again is going to be a really great resource for people. Make sure that your project proposal does have a good vehicle miles traveled reduction in the application. Great, I'm gonna quickly turn things over now to Aaron Busto from the Federal Highways Administration, and he's gonna talk a little bit about the role of that federal agency. So Federal Highways usually gets involved in this process uh, at the eligibility level. So when you submit an application to Dr. Cog as one of the early steps, it'll be reviewed and any questions of eligibility will be forwarded to us and we will look at it and work with Dr. Cog to um, provide our perspective. Um, that is specifically for the projects. The STBG eligibility, it pertains to the larger program eligibility of that group of funds. Um, once a project is approved, uh, there is some project authority issues such as um, how the agency has to handle all of the federal requirements and um, yeah, so that will be done more with CDOT and Dr. Cog than it would be with us, but uh, any questions on that would come to us. And 2CFR is the um, cost principles for the federal government, which pretty much tells you what you can and can't do with federal dollars. So. Again, it's not none of this stuff you would need to commit to memory, but it's good to know that if there's any questions that come up, these are higher level ones that will come to us and we will work with you uh, and Dr. Kyle to find a solution. Great, thank you. So to sort of um, just kind of add to what Aaron said, uh, if you are a nonprofit, just make sure that you've got the support of the local government where your, your project will take place. And um, as you can see here, the applications do have to be for new projects and activities. If you're applying for an expansion of an existing project, however, uh, what we ask is that you demonstrate new elements, um, like reaching new audiences or new, I guess, um, aspects that you're adding to the program. All right, so wanted to talk about limited or ineligible expenses. We always get this question. Unfortunately, incentives are not eligible and they cannot be included in the letter of intent or the application as a request for funding. Um, if you are a TMA and you're applying for TDM set aside funding, be aware um, that your project or your proposal for this funding should be uh, basically go beyond the typical outreach work that you have agreed to as part of the Dr. Cog partnership scope. And then finally, with this two-step process, the letter of intent followed by the application, this really allows Dr. Cog and the Way to Go program to help guide you and um, help you get the strongest application possible. So I wanted to break quickly for questions. Um, as I mentioned, there are two ways to ask questions. You can drop them into chat and Maddie will read them aloud, uh, or perhaps you can raise your hand and just unmute yourself and ask the question when we call on you. Hey, Nish, we had someone asked to go back one slide. So can we sure. move back to that one real quick? Yes, absolutely.
And any um, any questions in chat? Um, yes, we just got a question. Are you providing RTD Eco Passes eligible? From Kenna Davis. That's a great question. So RTD Eco Passes. Um, I'm actually going to turn this one over to Steve or John Mark Antonio. Um, this is a, a TDM strategy, but. Yeah, and I'll just quickly say this is this is a very um, common question. I, it's it, every every cycle. I think we get this question. the The trick, and 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 John, please fill in uh, what I'm missing here. But but the trick is uh, technically they would be eligible if you can verify that they're used during ozone season. And there's always been a challenge for us to you know with with the way the passes work to get to that place. So we've typically not seen them as, as part of what we're funding in this way. Now, one of the opportunities might be to look for other funding sources and provide those eco passes or, or other transit passes as sort of part of what you're doing. But, but this funding, I think, specifically cannot be used in that way because of that challenge of verifying it's only used on ozone days. So, John, what did I miss? Uh, I, I'm not sure you missed anything in, in going through and looking at previous projects. I, I haven't seen them be included as part of that. Um, we've seen mention of it being included from other funding sources as a complement to programs, but not directly funded by these. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, we have a hand up from Cami. Maybe similar, but I'm wondering, are stipends allowed or are they considered an incentive? Considering if we can set it up through our agency to pay for sort of more community support to help activate and launch and implement a VMT reduction program. So they wouldn't be an employee, but they would, would receive a stipend. I We'll also defer um, to John on that one, but it does seem like stipend would count as an incentive. Um, we do allow for staff time. Um, so I, I'm not sure though that that's necessarily yeah. what you're asking. No, because it's not incentivizing that person to participate in the program. This person would be helping implement the program. So again, an out of pocket cost and again um, um, most of the applications will you know include labor costs so I don't know specifically um, you know about, about about a stipend versus okay. you know paying somebody but it, it feels like we, we could sure look into that and um, like there's a chance that it would be eligible and Aaron, uh, Aaron, Aaron or John, please speak up <laughs> it, it sounds like Tammy is speaking to an ambassador program where she's paying, you know, folks from the community uh, a stipend to help promote TDM efforts. That's a good parallel. Yeah, it would be similar to that. Yeah, and I think, um, and again, J John or Aaron, um, please speak up. It, there might be some devil in the details on this, but it feels like um, we have in the past funded, I know we did a, a Bicycle Colorado um, project a couple of cycles ago that in, included um, uh, ambassadors that would ride with folks into and out of downtown. So that might be one we'd really just have to kind of dig into it with the details, uh, Tammy, and, and we're happy to do that. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up. Appreciate sure. it. All right, so we have another comment in the chat. This is regarding uh, the third bullet point on the PowerPoint slide that's pulled up right now. Um, an example given was if we wanted to do a quick build pop up bike lane or something more permanent like a covered secure uh, bicycle parking. This would not be a bike share program, but would promote and hopefully increase cycling mode. What? So I could take this one. So um, federal dollars in terms of bicycle, bike share and car share, uh, typically can be used for capital and infrastructure purchases, but they cannot be used for uh, operation, maintenance, or um, like membership, or um, here we just say subsidies, sort of, I think to capture that side of it, but um, infrastructure things, 
uh, and capital purchases, such as if you're going to start a bike share, you can get the bikes, you can get the um, dock, I believe it's called the dock, and things like that, but you cannot give out uh, discounted memberships or other things like that. The maintenance and operation side of things are not eligible. And it looks like Evan might have some further clarification or wants to add to that question. Evan, do you want to just unmute? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, so yes, this would just be for physical infrastructure, like uh, getting planters or paint to uh, put in short-term pop-up bike lanes and or bicycle parking uh, someplace where it might be needed. Uh, so maintenance of the facility itself might be necessary, uh, but it wouldn't be, people would be using their own bikes on it. We wouldn't be doing a bike share program like spin or jump. Um, it would be a bike parking facility someplace where it's necessary or a bike lane someplace where we see uh, more cycling activity to uh, engage the community in riding their own bikes more often. So would maintenance be covered uh, in that to fix paint or if uh, one of the racks is broken to repair uh, so the bicycle parking will be more available? Uh, uh, no, it is not. Uh, that, what I was saying earlier refers to all bike and pedestrian projects. But we can initially build it. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. We have a, another question from Derek. Um, he says, would offering e-bike rebates be eligible? I think we would need to look further into that one. I don't know if that one's come up before, so I don't want to say anything out of place. We will put that on the list to follow up with. Thank you. And then from Kenna, she says, would studying a micro transit slash circulatory route and or pilot project be eligible? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I think research of, of that kind is eligible. Um, and again, um, let me know, John or Aaron, if 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 that doesn't make sense. But I, I think I'll just point out one of the the challenges really with uh, research projects in in general is getting to that uh, uh, calculation of VMT reduction ultimately, right? Because typically you would do research and hopefully uh, you know the research points to something that we can then do that ultimately, you know, if we implement this thing, we're going to get that VMT reduction. So just if 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 you're interested in in doing a research project um, funded through this set aside, I would just really think through that and, and make certain that you, in essence, have a really good story to tell about how this ultimately will result in, in VMT reduction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just wanted to add, we will talk a little bit more about what kinds of projects are eligible under this funding in, in a later slide, um, but this is a call for non-infrastructure projects. So I think what uh, Aaron was responding to are really those federal definitions of capital versus maintenance. Um, so, so we will get to more details around that. Okay, any other questions? All right, in that case, we can go ahead and um, move on. Okay, so um, now that we've sort of talked about that first step in the process, that letter of intent, uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about the application process. Uh, but it is very simple. You start with the letter of intent. Dr. Cog will work with you um, to, again, come up with that strong application. You'll submit the application, we'll review it as a panel, and then take our recommendations to various committees um, before notifying the applicant. So again, this slide is just a reminder of all of those steps that will take place before, we, um, before we're actually able to fund the approved project. 
So we will kind of go over um, the letter of intent in a little bit more detail here. So um, I did just want to mention, and Maddie uh, can probably drop this into chat as well, but this letter of intent template is actually available on the drcog.org website. So all of you can actually go to the site today, download that letter of intent template, fill it out, and um, get that over to us if you, if, you, if you feel ready to do that. So again, we won't spend way too much time on these slides. Um, most of this information is fairly self-explanatory, um, but the first thing we need is an overview of the project. Again, just to sort of reiterate, the project types that you will see in this dropdown, there are basically four project types that we will be funding, and those are marketing, outreach, education, and research projects. Um, we do ask that you identify a single project contact within your organization, and that will be the person that way to go communicates directly with um, and to whom we'll issue the invitation to apply. When you're filling out your description, be detailed, but be concise. You do have a 500 word um, character maximum again, or, or word maximum. Be aware that this letter of intent is sort of the pre-application process. You don't have to go too much into the weeds here. Again, Dr. Cog is here to help you come up with those details that will help you um, provide the most you know, robust application possible. Um, I do encourage everybody, though, to use this description area to be detailed about how your project can improve transportation access and TDM in the region. So once we have received your letter of intent, as I mentioned, Dr. Cog's staff will review it to assess strategies to strengthen the application. And we do ask that you submit your letter of intent no later than the end of the day, Friday, May 5th. So please uh, put that, that timeline or be aware of that timeline. Okay, so as I mentioned, if the proposal that you outline in your letter of intent is approved, you will actually be invited to apply. This is the second step in the process. Um, and just again, be aware of these dates. June 2nd end of day is when we're asking for those applications to be submitted to Dr. Cog. Um, once, well, I already mentioned, we will send the application to those uh, letter of intent proposers who, who we've sort of accepted. Um, let's see, I do ask you to please review the subject line format. Um, I know poor Maddie probably gets hundreds of emails a day. If you can follow these best practices for your subject line, this will ensure that nothing slips through the cracks. It'll even be easy for her to potentially set up a rule so that we're all able to view all of these applications as they come in. Um, another, well, maybe a first reminder for everybody, um, just also be aware that your application will basically be turned into your scope of work for your project. So what you apply for has to align exactly with your goals, and then the application will become the basis for your project scope. So I think that's a really important um, note to, to be aware of. So as we talked about when we discussed the letter of intent, the most um, important criteria is VMTR or vehicle miles traveled reduction. So how many um, you know, travel miles were you able to save through your program? Um, the application questions are very straightforward. So we just ask that you respond by providing a detailed outline of your project vision. Again, I'm gonna say this again, VMTR is the most important. So please do emphasize the VMTR impacts of your project and include that data point in your application. So the first part of the application is going to be really similar to your letter of intent. You may end up adjusting this a little bit after your conversations with Dr. Cog's staff. Um, I do want to quickly mention that if you have a project proposal that will um, that will access RTD or CDOT property or right of way, you will need to get a letter of concurrence from those agencies. Um, so we would ask you to get that process rolling before the application due date. So if you can start talking to those agencies, let's say in the middle of May, that will set you up for success in terms of your timeline. 
And if you don't represent a local government, uh, do make sure that you receive and submit a letter of support from that jurisdiction. So these are sort of in addition to the letter of intent and the application, these are two other things that you need to be aware of. And again, just giving you a second reminder that this application becomes your project scope of work. So the vision, again, as you outline it here, should align exactly with your project goals. And when you're thinking about the scope and the different elements within your project, um, be detailed about what tasks you're going to have to achieve in order to reach your project goal. So envision how you'll implement the project, um, what steps you'll have to take, uh, what different phases of the project there are, what stakeholders you'll need to engage, um, and then add a title and a description to each task so that it's easier for you to look at at a glance and understand what your project scope will be, and also so it's easy for our panel to take a look at those tasks and really define whether or not or understand whether or not those tasks will help you achieve your, your goals. Um, we will spend a little bit more time talking about the match requirement in a later slide. So I am just going to really quickly leave this up here. Um, there is a match requirement here, but again, uh, Jim will talk about that in a later slide. Um, just a couple things to know, though, you can figure out your total project cost and then figure out the matching, or you can uh, figure out what you think Dr. Cog will give you and then figure out the matching based on that. You do have to meet the minimum required match, which is about 17%, but you can match more. Again, we'll go into more detail on that one because it's a bit, uh, bit complex. Um, so this is the piece of the application where you're going to break out where the funding is coming from, whether it's state or local, and you can break out those funding amounts by year to allow for a little bit more flexibility. Maybe you want to sort of front load some of those tasks, or maybe you want to back load those. This is your opportunity to figure out when uh, you will accomplish those, those project uh, tasks. So in this next section, we are really just looking for a high level overview of your timeline and an estimate of how much you plan to charge to the project. Um, to go to the subject of salaries quickly here, if you are listing salaries, if your proposal includes staff time, um, provide general information like the position title, uh, don't put in an employee's name, um, and this will, this will help again with the, with the application. Um, and then do just be aware that there are certain um, eligibility requirements for these, for, for basically for media equipment and production. These are all listed here. So just make sure you're aware of the eligibility requirements before you fill out and submit this application. Again, be granular when you're defining the individual costs under the grant and under your project scope. And, um, you know, like I keep saying, just be aware of eligibility, what is eligible um, under, under your project scope. So when you're filling out this part of the application, again, we want you to indicate which months you'll be doing each task. It does get very granular here. So you're going to have to really envision the scope of your project, not uh, just from, you know, um, the implementation phase onward, but really figure out what are all of those planning steps that you'll have to take. Um, and your project will begin once CDOT receives and executes your contract. And um, do be aware that the tasks in your timeline should correspond to what's in part one, question 10. So um, just, just look at part one, question 10 again, when you have your application in front of you, this will make a lot more sense, but you basically just want to copy each task from that section where you list out all of the project tasks and you um, add them to this text this text box on this page, put an X in the application next to each task um, to indicate which months you'll be performing them. So again, the application is fairly straightforward. We are here to help, but I think if you were to take a look at it post letter of intent, um, I, I, I do think that these questions will be a little bit more straightforward maybe than they seem as we're talking through them um, philosophically. So, the justification field, um, this gives you an opportunity to provide an explanation of how you came up with the predicted amount. 
And this could be based on the number of residents or the people you plan to target in your project. Um, it could be the number of commuters at a work site. There are a lot of ways you can sort of identify what that amount will look like. Um, you can also reference data from the census. If you have any internal research that you have done yourself, you can reference those uh, data points here in the application. But we really just want to see how are you coming up with this estimate? What is the justification and the explanation behind that data point? So um, we are going to ask you to calculate the VMTR, so the, the savings in vehicle miles traveled. Um, there is a fairly straightforward uh, formula here in the application. Um, we can help you with the math if you need it, um, but just be aware that the formula basically looks at the number of commuters or the people who are targeted by your program. Multiply that by the percent of commuters who we expect to shift that behavior. So let's say you've got 100 um, you know, people you're targeting, and realistically, you think 65 of them would be, would be um, candidates for behavior change. That would be that number that you multiply by. Um, and, and you're really looking at who you expect to shift those behaviors just one trip per day. Um, or rather one-way trips, there are two one-way trips per day, and then you multiply that by the number of benefit days each year, um, and then that outcome equals to the number of trips that you've saved. So again, talking through that formula probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but once you have, again, determined what that project scope at a very high level will look like, we do think that you'll be able to come up with this calculation. If you just can't, you're struggling, um, let us know. We're happy to help. And again, um, VMTR is really an important metric. So uh, make sure that your justification is strong and make sure that your project proposal really highlights VMTR. Um, we also look at innovation criteria. We wanna know whether you're serving new geographic markets. Um, and we also want to know, um, you know what the target audience looks like. And just be aware, this is a criteria for the grant. We also want to assess the utility of your proposal outside the, the scope of your project parameter. So is this a project we could replicate in a different region? Um, and what is the overall value of the project? Like who will benefit from it, basically? And so again, consider all of these criteria when you're drafting your proposal, whether it's writing the letter of intent or the application itself. And then here, we're just going to ask what other agencies you're partnering with. Um, I do want to note that if there's more immediate potential for your project to take off, you, you're really ready to get started on it right away, those projects with greater readiness will be scored higher. And then related, um, if you can show that your project will have more immediate benefits, so not just the implementation piece, but will actually benefit people sooner, we will also rank those projects a little bit higher as well. So again, wanted to break uh, for some questions. So we have one in the chat from Cami. She's wanting to know the time frame between uh, us at Dr. Cog receiving the letter of intent and then letting the um, people who have sent them in know that they are able to apply. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this typically happens within a couple of weeks, um, especially with the letters of intent. We review those fairly quickly. Um, if you were to get those in even before the deadline period, we could review those on a rolling basis. Um, Steve, do you have anything you'd like to add to that as far as timeline? No, I, I think I think that's uh, uh, well said, Nisha. And again, we we try to turn those around really, really quickly, and then get uh, you know once we're at that place where we are ready to basically invite people to do the full application. Um, we, we give people plenty of time uh, to do that. So nothing to add. Thank you. What other questions do we have, Maddie? That's the only one so far in chat. Um... Okay, perfect. Um, well, just a reminder, if you do have other questions, um, we will in several slides be breaking at the end of the at the end of the session to answer questions about the whole presentation. Or again, you can drop those into chat and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. 
I'm going to sort of breeze through these because I'm looking at the list of people on this call, and I think many of you are quite familiar with the way to go program, um, which I manage, but I did just want to talk quickly about who we are um, to give you a sense of how we plan to help you. Um, so way to go is basically a partnership between Dr. Cog and eight other transportation management associations in the region. I see a lot of you on the line here today. Um, we we really want, and I'm, I'm speaking for Dr. Cog as well as the way to go partnership, we want your program to succeed or your proposal to succeed, um, mainly because all of the projects that are funded under the TDM services set aside grant align really closely with our goals as a partnership, which is to remove single occupant vehicles from the road and get people into more sustainable modes of transportation. So our program is funded through CMAC dollars. Um, and really the funding is allocated for us to again, reduce traffic congestion to lead to improved air quality. And in addition to administering the TDM set aside grant, uh, way to go also hosts a lot of events each year. We've got Bike to Work Day coming up this June. Um, we work directly with commuters through out of home um, marketing and social media marketing. And then mostly what we do is work directly with businesses through outreach and we help them understand how they can invest in transportation benefits to best um, help their employees. So I did just quickly want to show this TMA coverage area. Um, we cover the nine county region um, around the Denver metro area. And you can see where our partners sort of cover uh, businesses and, and uh, their constituents in any of the gray area that is not covered by an existing TMA. That is the area that Dr. Cog covers. So my outreach team um, will work with businesses and constituents in these areas. And here is just a list of sort of the commute options that we recommend as part of our work. When we work with businesses, um, we, we really like to assess what is the commute option or the commute benefits plan that works best for the organization as well as their employees. Um, and then we do a lot of education for those workers on their options. Um, we talk about things like telework and flexible schedules in addition to all of these mode shift options. Um, and we talk to individuals who are interested in modifying their commute habits, whether we're working with their employer or not. Um, and finally, we give the public a lot of opportunities to engage in eco-friendly commuting through programs like Bike to Work Day, uh, Gotober, which is a, a campaign we run in the fall, and our monthly challenges. We also do quite a few annual campaigns, again, to highlight sort of the benefits of eco-friendly commuting. So you can see here, just at a very high level, here is how we connect with people. You can see we do a lot of the outreach work, a lot of advertising. Um, I talked a little bit about our events. Um, we really do try to create change though through these programs. So we do have quite a few campaigns running right now. Um, we do a lot of organic social media to raise awareness of way to go programs and the benefits again of eco-friendly commuting. Um, we do a lot of community outreach. You might see us at a tabling event, a health fair, um, Earth Day will we'll probably be there. Um, but we do really like to use our platform to encourage people to plan eco-friendly trips and track them. So if your project gets selected, um, way to go will support your project success in a few different ways. Um, you can ask us how we can help or you can tell us how we can help. Um, there are really a lot of different um, ways that we've gotten involved in the past. We can certainly sit on a committee. Um, we can review a marketing campaign. Um, we're happy to provide feedback on your project. And we do also ask that you talk about how Dr. Cog has supported your project and get other um other people to, to uh, you know, build awareness of these, of these set aside programs. Um, we will also help you promote your program successes on our social media and our owned media channels. So it is important for you to work with us throughout the implementation phase as well, because we may just have some ideas for how to draw attention to or highlight your program. Um, and finally, we often get proposals where we think, oh, you know, I know somebody in a different region who is working on something similar. We can connect you with subject matter experts or other stakeholders who can help you um, really succeed with your project. Perfect. So 
just wanted to put a little bit of contact info here. Um, I believe you have my contact information from all of the emails you've sent out. Uh, Maddie is also um, someone who you can email with any questions and she can get um, get you over to us. But we are happy to, you know, really just work with you to brainstorm um, the ways we can we can strengthen your letter of intent. If you don't have ideas for a letter of intent, but you really, um, you know, want to talk about TDM funding, get in touch and we're happy to do sort of an initial scoping and kickoff call. All right, so finally, just wanted to mention if your project is selected for funding, um, we do ask that you recognize way to go and highlight the role of the TDM funding in your project, any sort of marketing materials you do. Um, I would say if you have like a blog post or a web page, mention that part of the funding comes from the TDM set aside. And if you can mention us on social media, we're always grateful. We will also help you amplify your message. Um, and then during the next round of set asides, if you can share your successes with other agencies that will help more people take advantage of this funding. All right, so I am going to turn things over to Jim to talk a little bit about risk assessment, the budget and timeline. Um, Jim, just let me know when you want me to advance. Okay, thank you, Nisha. Uh, as Nisha said, I'm going to be talking about risk assessment and actually a letter of concurrence, the budget and, and timeline. Uh, so the, first, the, uh, the risk assessment form, that's something we're requiring that all applicants uh, su submit with their application this year. It's basically just uh, an Excel spreadsheet that you complete and you, you turn it in with, uh, with your application and CDOT reviews that. Um, the only implication of it is if you're considered a high risk uh, candidate, then then some additional steps might need to be taken to to be able to clean, complete your project. Um, so next slide, please. All right, letter of concurrence. So the thing to think about is, will your project um, require an approval from CDOT or RTD? um to go forward for example is it um is it interfere with some kind of right away or impact that in some way or does it need support from rtd or cdot so you will need a letter of concurrence to be um, submitted with your application and you should ask for that as soon as possible don't wait until you're ready to submit your application to do that you should really try and if you think you're going to need that you should request it by let's say april 27th uh, I think that's a good date to keep in mind. So it's something you want to do yesterday, really, um, if, if that helps. So next slide. All right, project funding and budget. So the big thing here, the important thing here is going to be your match and how you calculate that. So your match requirement is 17.21% of the total project cost. And so, for example, if your project cost is going to be $100,000, then the match requirement would be $17,210. And, and that's a kind of a simple way to think of it. There are um, <clears throat> a couple of different ways to calculate that. Um, for example, if you, if you know what the total project cost is, then it's pretty easy to just calculate divide multiply that by 0.1721 that gives you your match if you know what you don't know the total project cost but you know how much you're going to ask dr cog for uh there's a little bit of math involved there but you can take the project cost and i mean the dr cog portion of your project cost and multiply that by 0.2079 and that'll give you also your match requirement so um, and if you're really into math you, and you want to know how to get at that number, then you can you divide uh, 0 0.1721 by 0.8279, and that's how I came up with that. So, um, and if, I, I think every year we have somebody that kind of miscalculates this. So if you have, if you're not sure, if you have questions, maybe send me an email and I'll, I'll make sure you're doing it correctly. I'll be happy to help you out with that. All right, next, next slide, please. All right, in kind. Uh, part of your match can be, uh, it can be all in kind, or it can be a combination of cash and in kind, 
or it can be all cash. So when you're thinking about in-kind, uh, the thing, the really important thing to remember is things that qualify as in-kind, you would also have to be able to buy them using or pay for them using CMAC funds. So some of the things that we talked about is being ineligible, like incentives, uh, food, things like that. You can't buy that those things with a CMAC fund, so you also cannot accept them and turn them in as in kind. So it's a, that's a key thing to keep in mind. Um, and then the other part that is that is really important is when you submit your application, you have to have all your in kind match documented, the value of it, where you're going to get it, what it is, and and that um, that has to be submitted with your application. And the the important thing is that uh, also regarding that is uh, when you actually submit your in kind, uh, it has to it has to match up with what your application said. And so those two things are key. Um, and another thing, if um, make sure everything qualifies that you put on that form that you submit because um, well, next to the last bullet point, if you look at that, if one item on your list is rejected, you have to resubmit the entire form. So you wanna be really, really um, thorough when you look at that and make sure you edit it and, and review it before you, before you turn it in. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so, under your budget, you're going to have to um, provide a, a general description of your expenses and what you expect to charge to the, the STBG project or this project. So uh, an important thing to remember here is this is going to become part of your contract. So this is not an estimate. Um, when you turn this in, we're, you're going to be you're going to have to conform to this budget under your contract because it's it's going to become the budget for your contract. Whoops, uh, I think we went back one. <laughs> we'll have to move ahead. One more. All right. So, uh, so be careful. Very careful about. Uh, about how you fill this out, make sure you it's it, the expenses are things that uh, you can do the project within the parameters of the budget you're you're completing. Uh, a lot of expenses can be grouped. For example, you can use media as an expense uh, category. You don't have to say we're going to do so many ads on Channel Nine or on online, or but but you do have to have a broad categories identified. Salary is another thing uh, for your labor costs. It's important to um, not identify names of people on your staff that'll be working on this, but identify them by position and the number of hours that they'll commit to the project and then uh, their, their hourly rate. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Timeline. Um, Nisha went over this, a lot of this already, but when you complete your timeline, you're basically copying the, the tasks from, from question six and putting them in your timeline. And, um, and also, as Nisha mentioned, think about um, how you're gonna complete the project from the time you get the contract and not from, not from today or when you turn in your applications. So, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, you you can't you can't submit uh, you can't submit an invoice. You can't really start work until you have a fully executed contract. So, um, in terms of the timeline, it's important to keep that in mind. All right. So next slide: the contracting process. Perfect. So actually, uh, John is going to talk a little bit about this um jim okay yeah thanks appreciate it so um once the applications have all been down selected then we go on to the contracting process where we are actually taking that application as we just to re-emphasize again we take the application and we build the scope of work off of that uh, we go through work with you all 
and the FHWA to finalize and get approval for these projects, develop the contract, uh, get everyone's signature on it, and then actually issue a letter to proceed or a notice to proceed from CDOT. Uh, the important thing to emphasize here for folks, uh, there's a couple of things, but until you have the notice to proceed in hand, there are no eligible, you, you cannot incur any eligible reimbursements. So you can't go out and spend any money and then expect, even if they were part of your scope of work, expect to get a reimbursement once the contract is turned on. It has to be an expense occurred during the term of the contract. Um, on top of that, uh, this portion of the process has been uh, kind of burdensome in the past. I know it has caused some frustrations with how long it's taken. Um, that is something that we're aware of and we are working on. We've actually hired on, because of the amount of funding coming across uh, just nationally, uh, we are taking on four additional grant writers. So we are hoping to make this process a lot smoother for everyone. Um, by the time this goes around, I know there are a lot of folks on here who've gone through this once already. So uh, hopefully some good news for the, for the next round. If we wanna go to the next slide. Um, so again, reiterating how, how important it is when you are developing your application, the application uh, just, as we have with a number of our grants that we all work together on, the application becomes your scope of work. How you manage out your in-kind funds uh, is also how we will reflect that in the contract back. Any change to that, um, I know something that we have had to deal with, any change to in-kind match, we'll actually have to go re back through that approval process with the FHWA uh, each time. It is burdensome and we cannot reimburse or take any expense against that until that occurs. So there's just a, a reason why we're emphasizing it's just a lesson learned that we've had. Um, and then just continuing to emphasize on, on Jim's point, um, we want enough detail so that we know what you're going to spend money on. We know that it's going to be dedicated to the project, that it's going to be eligible for reimbursement but we don't want it finite enough detail where every single time we're going through an invoice, we have to go back and change some language somewhere to match exactly what the, the contract says to what the reimbursement is. We want some flexibility there so that, you know, by the time you apply and actually receive the grant and execute it, there is some flexibility for you all to, um, for, you know, let's say, uh, a rate on an ad spot to change, you know, hence why having media in there instead of, you know, nine specific ad slots from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in there. So um, just a, a good reason why we're, we're emphasizing this over and over. If you want to go to the next slide. Keep going. So, and then just to touch on reporting here. So reporting, uh, we'll expect throughout the, the process of the executed contract. Um, I know a number of folks are familiar with the templates. Uh, we will provide templates for reporting, uh, just as you all have seen in the past. Uh, we can talk through those uh, as needed. Uh, we have status reports, which are going to come in with each individual reimbursement request. Uh, so anywhere from monthly up to quarterly, depending on when we receive your reimbursement request, uh, we'll have a year end evaluation that we'll be looking for, and then actually a report at the end of the project. Um, and we'll actually see that as kind of the, the final mark of the project itself. With that will come the final payment out of the project. Um, what we're really trying to do here is, is capture how did the project perform overall? So in the application, we have this VMTR, uh, we'll capture some of those details in the scope of work itself. And what we're really trying to do is see how did we actually perform versus how we're actually, um, uh, how did we propose at the beginning? So a comparison of, of how we executed over the course of the, of the project. 
if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, and then just to set expectations appropriately, it's, you know, the final evaluation, like we emphasized here, is we are looking for the specific VMTR value and then how that compared to what we originally thought. So did we actually, with the amount of money that we invested in this project, see more vehicle miles traveled reduced or less compared to our estimates, allow us to kind of sharpen the pencil in the future and really document those lessons learned because what we're building here is um, uh, uh, an encyclopedia of strategies and, and how they work towards uh, TDM as a whole and VMTR. And then uh, we already made the bottom point, which was we, we do expect the final report to come across before the final reimbursement is made. I'm going to go to the next slide under reimbursements. So with the contract writing, we have also um, been working on improving our reimbursement process. We've, we've actually had a bit of growing pains over the last couple of months as CDOT has actually now brought on an, uh, an automated system as opposed to a manual system to be able to handle these. So by the time you all go through this, we will have standards uh, a standard process in place, many more people trained and reduce some of the uh, challenges and timelines that we've seen in the past, as well as best practices, uh, template documents. So for reimbursements as a whole, what we are looking for is the same that we have been looking for with any reimbursement that you've sent to CDOT in the past. We're looking for, uh, in summary, what costs were actually incurred during this time period, um, proof that they were incurred. So that could be your subcontractor invoice, employees, and what they actually worked on, that it actually related to the scope of work itself, um, receipts for all of these costs, uh, copies of the actual payments to your employees, um, timesheets that document that these employees, when these employees worked and what they worked on. Um, and then also documenting the burn down of your in-kind match uh, against the total that you have in the contract itself. Remember, if there's any change to that, we actually have to get that approved back through the FHWA uh, and then a progress report here as well. And I'm hoping by the time this most recent uh, or this next one goes across, uh, we will not just have the template for the reimbursement, but we will also have a, a genericized sample to go out as well um, as we, so that we can standardize our expectations between CDOT's business office and all of the recipients, whether new, new or old. And then here is just a picture of what our standard reimbursement form looks like. This is just the, the cover page here. This would go on top that summarizes which expenses you incurred, whether that be employees or uh, contractor invoices, um, noting your match, the amount of reimbursement you're expecting, the balance left on the contract, the contract period. This is kind of the, the summary sheet that gives a lot of information on the current status of the contract as a whole in terms of reimbursement. Right. Thank you so much, John, Thanks. appreciate that. So we're pretty much nearing the end of this presentation. Um, I just did wanna share some key dates. I also wanted to mention, um, we are aware of some of the uh, comments in chat around the timelines. Um, I am gonna have Steve talk a little bit about how to sort of manage expectations, manage your schedule in order to meet these dates. Um, but as you can see, the application workshop um, is already almost over. So that's kind of step one in this process. Um, the letters of intent are due April 27th. Um, I think, Jim, I uh, really appreciate you talking about when those letters of concurrence should also be, should also be due um, if, we, if they need to provide those from CDOT and RTD. 
And then again, the application period or the application deadline is June 2nd. Um, but Steve, uh, Steve and I have just been chatting a little bit about um, some strategies that you all can follow. So I will turn things over to him quickly. Thank you, Nisha. Yeah, and I guess um, I, I, I certainly understand um, there's a lot of work that goes into particularly, you know, preparing that full application and, you know, materials you need to gather and a lot of conversations you need to have. I guess what I would say that would be if you're really concerned about sort of that that timeline of, of, of basically a, a full month from hopefully the time we get back to you with kind of a thumbs up after we work through the letter of intent, I guess what I would say uh, is get those letters of intent in as soon as possible. You could send us a letter of intent this afternoon or tomorrow, and we will start um, sort of reviewing that and getting back in touch with you um, and trying to work through any issues that there might be, um, you know, even related to some of the, you know, the eligibility kinds of things. So sort of the sooner the better on that. And I guess from my team's perspective, we're going to really make a commitment um, that if we receive a letter of intent on Thursday, April 27th, we're going to get back to uh, the, the sponsor uh, within a couple of days and just work through, if we can, whatever issues there might be and get you that, that invitation uh, to fill out the full application. Um, this is something if, you know, if we get a lot of, if we have a lot of issues, I mean, we can be somewhat flexibility or flexible, I should say, with respect to some of the supporting materials. I know we've had instances in the past as an example where um, maybe that letter of concurrence, it takes some time to work its way through the pipeline at, at RTD or CDOT or whatever. We can have some flexibility there. I mean, our, our goal, again, is to get in uh, a bunch of great uh, project applications, um, you know, and have good projects to choose from, and we'll do everything in our power to, you know, to help make that happen. So, um, yeah, and, and reach out if, if anybody has any concerns uh, apart from uh, what I've just shared, reach out to me directly, and I'm sure we can work through it. Thanks, Steve. And I just uh, saw two chats um, here I wanted to address. It looks like maybe the dates are, um, for the letter of concurrence here is incorrect. Um, I will just have to double check that and we can follow back up. Um, and then Evan had a question. I think, John, this is one for you. He was curious, um, since TMAs apply for reimbursement through CDOT for CMAC and TMO, TMO support, are TMAs technically direct recipients of federal funds? Yeah, I was, I was actually just looking at that. I will have to ask our business office for sure. I was just looking uh, through some of the resources I have, and it, they may be considered child recipients, but since it comes through CDOT as the administrator of the funds, we may be considered the parent recipient. But I'll have to uh, I'll have to get back on that one for you, Evan. Thank you. Um, and while I just I have everyone, let me pull up the 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 website just so we can double check those dates. I'm going to stop sharing my screen really quickly. Um, it looks like Karen has a question in here. How much was the pool of funding for TDM set-aside grants in the past two funding cycles? Um, that's a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, Steve, do you possibly remember that one? Uh, yeah, I, at least I remember the last one. Um, uh, I'm not the exact dollar amount. We had $900,000 uh, that was sort of you know new funding, so that's gone up to a million. We also had some returned funds, and I I hesitate to say this, but it, it's possible that we'll have some returned funds that end up, um, you know, in in this pot as well. Uh, you know, for for this call, we just don't know that number yet. Um, often oftentimes that would come into play. You know, if we're looking at um, you know funding five or six or seven projects, and there you know might be a, a project that the review panel feels is sort of you know, um, right on that line where we've expended this funding, the million dollars, then we'd look to so to some of those return funds, uh, you know, to see if, if we might be able to make something work. So, and mm -hmm. I, I, Karen, I don't remember, I'm sorry, from what would have been now almost four years ago, we could go back and look and sure get back mm -hmm. to you if that's helpful. All 
Perfect. Yeah, and uh, your your other question, how many projects were funded in those cycles? I can speak to the most recent round. I believe we approved eight projects. We received 11 applications. Um, let's see. So just looking at these dates, um, let me follow up in an email um, in, in case these are not correct. I just want to add something real quick. I think the dates are correct on the website. There might have been a little bit of confusion because on one of the slides, uh, the letter of concurrence, it says it should be submitted by April 27th. Um, but that is the actual deadline for the um, letter of intent. So I think those might have gotten mixed up in the um, in the slide deck. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying that, Maddie. And that is my understanding too. Um, it does sound like Jim mentioned, we want those letters of concurrence with the application. So as long as you can get those in by June 2nd from CDOT and RTD, we should be good to move forward. It's really that letter of intent um, due on the 27th that, that we are um, most concerned about at this point. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I don't see anything in chat, but if someone would like to raise their hand and, and ask something, we've got some time to address things. Thank you, Maddie. And Maddie just uh, dropped the, the website page into chat. This is also where you can download, or actually um, you can learn a little bit more about the set aside. And then if you actually go here, um, you should be able to download the letter of intent template. You may have just said this, Nisha, but can you remind us, is the application itself available to review ahead of time? Or uh, so would that only be shared once we got invited? That's exactly right. So if your letter of intent is approved, we will send you the application, but there is a little bit of a cheat code here. Um, after this call, we are gonna upload this deck. Um, as you recall, I went through quite a few of the application fields in detail. So if you were to look through that deck, you could see exactly what those questions would look like. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then Evan, to, to just follow up with you, John said he is just going to get some additional information on your question around whether or not TMAs are direct re recipients of federal funds. So we will definitely follow back up with you on that. All right. Well, I don't see uh, any more questions in the chat. Of course, uh, do feel free to um, to email me. I'm just going to share my screen one more time um, because we do have a final kind of like a contact contact list. So um, I think um, you should have my email, Steve's email, and Maddie's email from the messages you received through in your in your inboxes. Um, Maddie also dropped our emails into chat a couple of times, so um, do feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, but this is essentially, um, you know, the the process that we outlined is what we'd like you to follow. And just the takeaway I wanted to leave you all with is that we're here to help you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, John, and I know Aaron had to drop, but John, thank you so much for your um, attendance. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.